Okay, everybody, we are live. Welcome to this Earth Live session. Um, we are live from Bristol. My name's Alistair, and I'm talking to you from Bristol in the UK. Um, I've spent the last two decades working on ocean conservation, initially as a biologist, counting colorful things underwater and now working for Blue Ventures, which is an organization based here in Bristol that's dedicated to supporting coastal communities in their work and their efforts to protect the ocean. Now, in keeping with tradition, I'm going to be opening by sharing my most memorable and exciting wildlife adventure. So if this screen to my right is going to work, just bear with me. Here we are. Now, I'm incredibly lucky to have spent a huge amount of time working above and below the water in some of the world's extraordinary um, places, far from home. But the most amazing wildlife encounter I've ever had was actually here in the UK. Um, not in some far off tropical ocean, but in the remotest part of the British Isles here, in fact, around the St Kilda archipelago, which is about 40 miles off the west coast of the Isle of Harris in the Outer Hebrides. We often think we need to travel to far off tropical jungles in order to see amazing wildlife. But the best wildlife counters, encounters I've ever had have been here at home in Britain. St Kilda is in the northeast Atlantic. And it's there that I was able to see these amazing orca up close. I was sea kayaking around the whole archipelago. I saw dolphins, basking sharks, seals, jaw-dropping geology, and a sky absolutely full of seabirds. Gannets, puffins, razorbills, shearwaters, storm petrels. It's all out there, and even here in Britain. Now, I want to use the time that we've got together this evening to take you on a journey away from St Kilda, away from the Northeast Atlantic to tropical seas to share with you some insights into a truly remarkable animal. It's the foundation of an even more amazing ecosystem that's the cornerstone of food security and of livelihoods for hundreds of millions of people. Now, this is the animal. Or rather, this is where the animal used to live. Or rather, this is where hundreds, this is the home that was built by hundreds of those animals, genetically identical, living together in what's called a colony 
in warm, shallow, tropical seas. Now, the animal, of course, is called a coral. It's a marine invertebrate. It's a sac-like animal, only a few millimeters in width, and it's closely related to sea anemones and jellyfish. Now, corals excrete an exoskeleton near their base made of aragonite, which is a form of calcium carbonate. And over many generations, that aragonite builds up to form these sizable skeletons which eventually can be many meters across and hundreds of different colonies thousands of colonies often of hundreds of different species can grow together to form complex three-dimensional structures like coral reefs which are some of the largest living structures on earth now reefs cover less than one thousandth of the surface of our oceans but they're home to about one in four ocean species. Some are absolutely massive. They can be seen from space. We've all heard of Australia's Great Barrier Reef, which is over 1,400 miles in length. Coral reefs build whole islands. They protect coastlines from enormous wave energy and storm surges, and they often underpin fisheries, helping to feed entire coastal nations. Now, there are almost infinite ecological relationships, relationships between species of plants and animals that occur on coral reefs. Um, but I want to think about just two of them because I think that they help set the stage for the work of conservationists, people like me working to safeguard and protect these ecosystems and many others like them. Now, the first relationship that I want to talk about is the relationship between the coral and and algae. Now, these animals grow in very, very nutrient poor waters. Nothing gets wasted and there's not much spare food going around for these corals to eat. They're stuck to the seabed, so they can't necessarily jump out and grab some food. And they've managed to get around this problem by a very unique adaptation. Living within their tissues is a photosynthetic alga a form of what's known as a dinoflagellate, also known as a zooxanthellae. Now, these amazing microbes are photosynthetic, so they produce able to produce sugars and, and other organic compounds using light energy from the sun. These compounds are harvested by the coral, and in return, the algae get somewhere safe to live, as well as nutrients and carbon dioxide from the coral. Now it's these algae, these zooxanthellae, that are responsible for the incredible colors that we see in corals and coral reefs. And it's a really unique and incredible form of symbiosis, of mutual dependency between species. Now it's also an incredibly delicate one. It's um, a fragile relationship that can break down when the coral gets stressed, for example, from changes in temperature, light, or nutrients. And that can have disastrous consequences for both parties. And this is happening more and more with global climate change, which is creating hotter and hotter waters. And corals, when they get stressed, they will expel those zoos and theli from their tissues. They will turn white because it was those algae that had the color. They're bleached. They're effectively starving at this point. Now, when a colony has got to this kind of condition, it's pretty bad. And two things can happen at this point. Waters can either cool and the coral will capture new dinoflagellates from, this, from the water or some residual zooxanthellae from its tissue, tissues will be recovered in the whole remaining colony and the colony will get its color back and it will be able to feed again. But if that thermal stress is particularly severe or prolonged, the coral won't be able to do that and the stress will kill it and it will, will die as a result. So bleaching and heat stress, as it's known, is incredibly serious for corals. Now, a question that's just come in from Facebook, how deep in the ocean can corals be found? Well, corals are found at staggering depths, thousands of meters, but reef building corals, these warm water corals that build the framework of coral reefs as we know them, those ecosystems that we just saw in some of these earlier pictures, are only found in the photic zone of shallow tropical and some subtropical seas, so around 30 degrees north or south of the equator down to a depth of 
40 or 50 meters. Most of the habitat is sub 25 meters. Now, the second ecological relationship that I want to talk about to help you understand how this relates to conservation is an arms race that takes place on a coral reef every day between the heroes of the story, these fabulous corals. This is a very different genus of coral. It doesn't have that wonderful branch structure. It's a slower growing coral and a primitive plant, specifically a seaweed. Now, in my reenactment here, seaweeds are going to be played by these wild onions that I've just pulled up from my garden. Now, corals grow very slowly, um, although you'll actually be surprised at how quickly some of them grow. Some genuses, genera like this Acropora, which is a framework building coral, it's a fast growing coral, it might grow radially about that sort of distance every year in both directions, of course. So from its surface area will increase very, very, very rapidly over time. But still, that's nothing compared to how fast these guys can grow. Many of you will have heard of giant kelp, which is another form of algae, a seaweed. It can grow at two feet per day to lengths of over 45 meters. So corals are really up against it in this arms race on the coral reef between corals and seaweeds. Fortunately, they've got a very, they've got an advocate, they've got an ally on their side, and that is the herbivores on the reef. Now, these herbivores are represented today by this coconut who's been dressed up to look like a fish. Unfortunately, his teeth don't look particularly herbivorous, but I'm afraid that's the best I could do for today. So these herbivores, and there are many different kinds of herbivores on a coral reef, not just fish, lots of invertebrates too, they keep those algae, those fleshy seaweeds in check to create lots of bare substrate on the coral reef. It might look a little bit like this, some exposed calcium carbonate there, or perhaps on this side, you can see what's called a encrusting coralline algae, which is ideal settlement surface for juvenile, for baby corals, which settle from the planktonic phase from the water column onto the coral reef. So when corals spawn and their babies settle, they're able to do that because these surfaces are kept clean by our friendly grazers, our herbivores here. But when we get rid of these grazers, when we get rid of these herbivores, as happens, for example, with overfishing or some forms of disease, the seaweeds can grow unchecked, rather like the wild onions in my garlic, in, 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 in my garden. And the corals are very quickly smothered by these seaweeds. Now that's a very bad situation for a reef to get into because once it's got into this condition, it's very difficult to turn things around. It's the beginning of what we call in ecological terms, a phase shift from one that was once dominated by these complex reef building organisms that are actually building the very foundation of the ecosystem to a low diversity system characterized by these weedy species, these, these fast growing, fleshy algae. Of course, that's very bad for corals. It's very bad for biodiversity, the, the, the complexity, the diversity of life on that ecosystem, on that reef. It's also really bad for the reef itself because survival of a coral reef as a system, as an ecosystem, is very much a race between coral growth, the ability of these colonies to keep growing every year, and erosion, the pounding pressure of that wave energy hitting that reef. Now, corals love to grow in high energy, well oxygenated, clear water, tropical environments. And that's the ideal habitat for them to grow in. Once you start adding nutrients, then the seaweeds grow a lot faster. So that means there's a lot of erosion going on there. So very quickly, if a coral reef is covered in seaweeds, because there aren't enough herbivores on that reef, then things can start to fall apart very quickly. There's lots of, of organisms that will be burrowing within the framework, particularly invertebrates. And the very ecosystem, the foundation of the reef, the framework itself can start to founder and fall away. So why am I telling you about these two ecological relationships, one between corals and their photosynthetic zooxanthellae and one between corals and these fleshy seaweeds. Well, as I mentioned, we only see reef building corals in shallow tropical waters around the equator. That's around 30 degrees of latitude north and south. Water here is already quite hot. 
And corals are supremely adapted to living in these environments, but they live very much at the upper limit of their thermal tolerance. They can't handle the stresses that we're throwing at them with ocean warming. And the latest predictions of corals and coral reefs and climate change are grim. Corals are in serious trouble. This last image shows sea surface temperature around the Indian Ocean last week. These are warm waters in the tropics getting hotter from the subtropics to the tropics and cooler towards the poles as we'd expect. This image shows areas of sea surface temperature anomaly, areas of accumulated stress in specific areas over the last three months. And that gives us a pretty good indication of where that phenomenon of bleaching, that starvation of corals from that thermal stress might be taking place. If you look here, you can see the Western Indian Ocean, the island of Madagascar, there's quite a lot of warm water there. And indeed, these pictures taken just a few days ago by my colleagues in Madagascar confirm these predictions. It might be difficult to see on the feed, but here we can see numerous completely bleached colonies. There's an Acropora, the same genus as this one, the most diverse genus of reef building corals, as well as a number of encrusting and massive corals there, favids and parietids, which are generally more thermally tolerant, and even they are bleaching. And indeed, if we fast forward, what might that look like after a massive mortality episode? Well, here we can see a reef that has completely succumbed to that bleaching. All of those colonies are, are dead. And that's, an, that's a heartbreaking image for us to look at. And of course, once the seaweeds have got taken hold, if there isn't enough grazing on that reef, that could be the very end of the entire ecosystem. Now, as conservationists, what on earth can we do to address these enormous challenges? Taylor's just asked on the feed, can we still save most coral reefs, although bleaching has become more common due to climate change? Taylor, you're quite right. These bleaching episodes previously might have happened every 10 or 15 or 20 years. We're now seeing them happen annually. What we've just seen there from Madagascar has happened every year for at least the last five or six years. So what can we do as conservationists to address these massive threats over which we might not have much ability to affect change at a local level? Well, of course, decarbonizing our economy is the single most important thing that we as a species can do to protect life in our seas, including coral reefs. But beyond that, one of the most important things that we can do to protect these fabulous reef building species is to protect the broader ecosystem and that includes protecting these fabulous herbivores and this brings me back to that second interaction making sure we've got enough herbivory got enough grazing going on on the coral reef to keep those seaweeds in check we can do that by ensuring that reefs are adequately protected within from other threats like overfishing within marine protected areas, within marine reserves or refuges. This helps us shore up some of that underlying resilience in that ecosystem and help protect their ability to bounce back from some of those bleaching disturbances if they're short lived. Now, science tells us that we should be protecting about one third of the area of our oceans across all habitats within fully protected no-take zones from which all forms of extraction, including fishing, are prohibited. That kind of scale is what we estimate that we need in order to be able to restore and reseed the more degraded and fished areas beyond those permanent marine protected areas. That's easier said than done because the challenge is that marine reserves are often established without consulting with fishermen and fisherwomen, the people who depend on species like these for their livelihoods and often for survival. Conservation areas established by scientists like me or by governments from the top down without adequate local ownership often fail. Here in the UK, where I'm from, for instance, we protect just seven square kilometers, less than one 40th of a single percent of our domestic exclusive economic zone within fully no-take marine reserves. As a result, we're miles behind where we need to be in terms of robust, ecologically meaningful ocean protection. Now, I've spent my entire career 
working to find ways to, to, to address this. Sadly, not here in the UK around St Kilda or in the Bristol Channel where I'm talking to you from today, but thousands of miles away in the world's tropics, which are home to most of that spectacular biodiversity, but crucially also home to most of the people who depend on fishing, who depend on that life in our ocean to, for, for survival, for subsistence and for income. And the good news is that we're seeing a new wave of approaches working with fishing communities to design and manage marine conservation areas that deliver real benefits, not just to nature, not just to these guys and these guys, but also to the people that depend on life in our oceans. This is the coast of Madagascar in the Mozambique Channel off the east coast of Africa. People here depend on fishing for food, for income, for their very survival. There's very little else. And these people, these fishing people, have become vocal advocates, not against conservation, but for robust, extensive protection of their ocean and for the rights to manage that that cons those conservation areas from their governments themselves at a local level. They've been so effective that 18%, in, in, in excess of 18% of Madagascar's inshore seabed is now under local management, affecting hundreds of thousands of people. And that's one of the longest coastlines in Africa. Now, it's not all plain sailing, but early indications of this movement are incredibly positive. From some of those areas, communities have managed to eliminate destructive industrial bottom trawlers, industrial fishing being a hugely destructive threat to fragile ecosystems like coral reefs and seagrasses. And Communities have also set aside within those conservation areas strict no-take zones, areas from which all forms of fishing are prohibited. That natural savings account within which life can recover and help reseed and restock the fished and more degraded areas beyond. And very excitingly, what we're now seeing in Madagascar for the first time in the region, 10 years on, is that fish populations with inside those reserves are starting to recover, both relative to where they were 10 years ago, but also to the fished areas of reef outside. And this means more herbivory, more grazers, more resilience, more breathing space for those reefs to cope and those corals to cope with what we know is coming down the road with global climate breakdown. So in Madagascar, and in countless countries across the tropics, we're seeing conservation not becoming a rarefied discipline of ecologists and scientists like me, but a social movement empowering communities to protect the sea and stand up for their basic rights to fish and to protect their ecosystems from outside threats. So for any budding conservationists out there, as I've learned, there's a lot more to a career in conservation than ecology, and counting corals, which is how I started out in my career. And the impact that we can have by protecting these exquisite ecosystems, these incredibly important coral reefs, isn't just benefiting people, but it's also benefit, benefiting nature, but it's also benefiting hundreds of millions of people and helping ensure that these ecosystems can stand up to, to climate change. Now, I'd very much like to talk all night, but I'm conscious of the time. And I would encourage you, while I'm allowed a plug, to follow the work of the organization that I, I work for, Blue Ventures, on Twitter at Blue Ventures and Instagram at Beyond Conservation. But without further ado, I would love to jump in to some of these questions. Um, Cunningham has asked, where is the healthiest reef and the most effective affected reefs in the world? Well, Alex, there are very there are some few coral reefs that are still out there that are completely unimpacted by um, by fishing, which is the main human-induced direct impact on coral reefs, along with pollution um, and, and sedimentation from, from land use. They are typically in offshore ocean ecosystems. Um, the UK's overseas territories is a really good example. The French overseas territories, the American overseas territories. Um, if you were to go to a, an archipelago like Pitcairn in the central Pacific Ocean, one of the remotest inhabited places on the planet, there you'll see coral reefs growing in relatively cool water for corals. There's 
quite a lot of thriving reef life there and of, of course a huge amount a huge amount of, of herbivory that's maintaining some of that resilience the worst affected reefs tend to be areas that are experiencing a huge amount of overfishing or pollution one of the key factors that we're seeing that's killing australia's great barrier reef is the constant inputs of nutrient rich pollution particularly phosphates and nitrates from agriculture that's entering into the shallow inner reef areas causing that huge growth not of onions but of algae that are that are that are, are that undermining the resilience of those of those corals and preventing their ability to bounce back from bleaching and very tragically what we're seeing this year is the beginning of another severe bleaching episode in that extraordinary ecosystem um just to say, it's really, really loud noise every time you touch the microphone. Jane, I'm terribly sorry about that. Um, I won't be touching it anymore. Um, Scott Hennessy's asked, what types of animals eat the coral reefs? Well, there are thousands of species that live uh, in coral reefs in the tropics. Um, very few of them eat the reef because the reef is, is massive, but a number of cor coralivores, these are species typically of fish or some reptiles, will be able to munch on the hard substrate of the coral itself. Parrotfish, for example, uh, a, a key species that produces a lot of the sand that we see from coming from coral reefs, they will actually munch on the coral itself. Um, I'm just looking at other questions that are coming in. I'm conscious of time. Lizzie, what can we do at home? What can we do to, protect, uh, to help with the protection of coral reefs? Well, I think one of the most important things that we can do is be conscious of what we're eating as consumers. A lot of the fish that we will be consuming in a northern country, in a European country, like the UK, for example, will have come not from the European Union or the UK waters, but from the global south, from distant water fisheries. About 70% of what we consume in the EU, similar to the US, comes not from our domestic waters, but from far away and typically from poor countries. And those countries will probably be tropical countries. They may be food insecure, they'll certainly need their fish for food security. Um, and what we're often doing through our consumption, our rapacious consumption of fish, often brought to countries through distant markets, is undermining that ecology and also undermining those livelihoods. Other things that we can do here in the UK, of course, supporting conservation organizations, the UK's Marine Conservation Society does an amazing work, Surfers Against Sewage similarly, and of course, Blue Ventures as well. So I'd really encourage you to get out there and support your, your local conservation organizations. I think that's just about it. We're almost out of time. Oh, Kay Parry has just jumped in with a question. Um, I'm currently studying marine biology. How can I get involved with helping marine conservation? Um, love the whale shark in the background. Thank you. That's a whale shark made from used flip-flops from Kenya. Um, I would encourage you, Kay, to reach out to conservation organizations near you that are getting involved in protecting the sea. Remember that Working in conservation doesn't just require degrees in counting fish and marine biology. Um, within the organization that I work for, we have communication specialists, we have filmmakers, um, we have some scientists, we have accountants, we have people that are really good at managing people and projects. So there's all kinds of ways that you can add value and make a meaningful contribution to conservation, as well as, of course, in the fish that you buy and the, the, the things that you consume. I think that's just about it, guys. We are now out of time, so I'm going to end it there. Thank you for joining us this evening, and please do check out Blue Ventures on Twitter to find out more about this kind of work. Thank you. <laughs>